Hello everyone this is part 1 of what if Naruto rescued Hinata, this story is made by sgamer82, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great. It's in the description. A girl was laid flat on the wooden floor of a hut, so she could not move. The girl was scared. She didn't remember how she'd wound up here. She had been in a forest with friends, things went black, and she had woken up here. The only thing she knew was something was in her head. A voice, a voice that sounded like an old man. The old man. Don't resist. It'll be much easier for you. I must. I can't let you do what you're trying to do. Do you even know what I'm trying to do? Something to my mind, something to change me. Hey hey hey. Good. You're sharp. I knew I'd made a good choice. She will be most pleased with you. She. She who. That will not be your concern, dear girl. You'll be able to leave that to another. Another. The girl didn't get to dwell on that odd remark, for the old man had stopped pacing. He made a gesture and two men, unseen by the child's eyes, see loose her bonds. However, they did not move her. In minutes, the girl began to awaken. She looked at her surroundings, her face radiating confusion. Where? What? Who? She asked in her bewilderment. The old man kneeled before her. Hello, child. W who are you? She asked. I am the chieftain of the Nimari tribe. And you, my dear. He brought his wrinkled hand to her cheek as looked the girl right into her pupil-less white eyes. You are Kash Yuingar, she of the ghostly eyes, the chosen one of our people. Far from the birthplace of, she of the ghostly eyes, another day was passing in the village of Konohagakur. The end of a training session for Jenin's cell number 7, consisting of Haruno Sakura, Uzumaki Naruto, and Uchiha Sasuke. Their teacher, Hitaki Kakashi had just dismissed them, but as he was turning to leave, Naruto found himself being called back by Kakashi. Naruto went to his teacher, to see he wasn't alone. He was standing next to a woman. Naruto recognized her as Yuhi Kuranai, a Jonin and Cell instructor like Kakashi. She was in charge of Cell 8, Abarain Shino, Inazuka Kiba, and Hyuga Hanata. Naruto, said Kakashi, his voice, as always, seemingly unaffected by the mask he wore over his face 24-7, I have some good news for you. Oh, Naruto asked, curious and excited. You're going on a mission. We are. Naruto asked. No, you are. Huh. I'll let Kuranai Sensei explain everything to you, said Kakashi as he vanished in a puff of smoke. Kuranai looked Naruto right in the eyes. With your permission, Naruto, she began, you're going to be loaned out to my team for a brief time. What? What are you talking about? Something has come up. Kuranai explained, and we think Cell 8 will need your assistance. It's already been approved by Hokage Sama, though I wish to ask for your consent before dragging you along. Well, of course. Naruto said, his inner's beginning to overcome his surprise, what major task do you need my great skill for? Since you're so eager, I'll get straight to the point. Hanata has gone missing. You've just been recruited to help us find her. Naruto's excitement d the instant his brain processed what he'd just been told. It has been less than a week ago. With the loss of so many shinobi during the battle against the ninja of the villages hidden in the sand and sound, Genin teams had been receiving much more difficult missions. It was on just such a mission that Hanata was lost. Cell 8 had been investigating recent attacks on farming towns up north that had begun since a recent earthquake. One night, thanks to Hanata's Byakugan, they caught sight of a scout. The team followed, Kiba and his dog, Akamaru, doing the majority of tracking. There, the cell learned that the robbers were bands of primitives. Perhaps aboriginines, or hunters who lived deep in the woods having difficult times. Regardless, the Kanoa ninja were prepared to take them down and turn them to the local authorities. What they had, in no way, expected was an attack on themselves first. They were small in number, perhaps 20 or so, but surprisingly well trained. Far too well for primitives or hunters. But that wasn't what Kuranai could focus on. She directed her team to watch out for each other while Kuranai dealt with their attackers. She was able to fight off several of them. However, in the course of the fight, some had made their way to the Genin. 
Kuranai rushed to their aid, but not before the three had been beaten down. It couldn't have been helped, they were outnumbered and surprisingly overpowered. When Kuranai defeated the bandits attacking her students, she saw only Shino and Kiba were present. Bruised and beaten, but alive. Hanata was gone. Kuranai also noticed the attack had ended. They were running. With sudden alarm, Kuranai looked and saw them carrying away Hanata. She immediately began charging but the remaining fighters, and some that had recovered enough from Kuranai's beatings to get up, blocked her path. Focused solely on stopping her from proceeding. Faced with the decision, Kuranai did the only thing she could. She scooped Kiba and Shino into her arms and ran. A Kamaru following close behind. She hated herself for leaving Hanata behind. But she had little hope of reaching her in that situation. By all indications, these people were familiar with the forests and she'd be hard-pressed to track them. If they split up, it'd be even worse, for she'd have no idea who'd have Hanata. Also, in that event, it would only take one of them to double back and find Shino and Kiba. Then it would be her entire team lost. Kuranai had run. But she swore to herself, she would return and get Hanata back. So, what happened to Shino and Kiba? Naruto asked as he got his things together in a backpack. Kuranai had explained what happened on the way to Naruto's home. Kuranai replied, they're recuperating in the village that we were staying in. There's a doctor who knows medical ninjutsu, they should be fully recovered when we arrive. I don't understand, though, why do you need me? He asked, genuinely perplexed. He'd seen enough of Jonan to know they were immensely powerful. Enough that Kuranai should have been able to go alone and get Hanata after Kiba and Shino were safe. I wasn't sure what to make of our adversaries. Kuranai replied, therefore, I thought it prudent to return to the village and inform Hokage Sama of this. She explained a few things to me. Among them the possible Idinis, an agenda, of the bandits. If she's right, we'll need you. Well, I don't totally understand. But okay. Naruto answered. He honestly didn't know what contribution he'd make in this endeavor. But he'd give it his all, like he always did. He liked Hanata. She was odd at times, but he had a lot of respect for her. While he didn't know Shino very well, he had also become a combination of friend and rival with regards to Inazuka Kiba. If he could help them when they needed it, he wouldn't hesitate. He'd join Team 8, for the time being. He'd find Hanata. No matter what, he hefted up his pack and let Kuranai Sensei know he was ready to leave. It took only two days to reach the northern village, Kuranai setting a pace that only Naruto's immense stamina allowed him to follow without constant rest. When they arrived, Shino and Kiba were back at full health, ready to join in the mission. Both were quite surprised to see Naruto among them. Though only Kiba actually expressed this shock. What the hell are you doing here? Kiba shouted, not caring of the scene he was making in the village square. I was asked to come here by your sensei. Shouted Naruto, also not caring of the scene he was making in the village square. That can't be. It can so. No way. Kiba said, with some barks from Akamaru agreeing with him. It is, Kiba. Kuranai interrupted, as soon as I finished reporting what happened to Hokage Sama I insisted on bringing Naruto with me. Why? Because, Kiba, if what Hokage Sama told me is correct, then this mission will require a team made up of people who know Hanata well. Besides you, Shino, and I that leaves Naruto. Sensei, Shino spoke up. Why is it important to have people who know Hanata? Let's go. I'll explain once I'm sure. I need to confirm something first. The genin followed their sensei through the thick forests outside the village. The woods were every bit as thick as the forests within Konohagakur. If not thicker than that, the trees provided a roof over them with only the occasional beams of sunlight peeking through. A foreboding place that reminded the genin of the forest of death way back in the Chunin selection exam. Though, fortunately, the deadly creatures from that forest weren't present here. If they were, the farming town behind them would have more to fear than simple bandits. Though when Kuranai suddenly stopped and cursed under her breath, the boys thought that maybe that was the case anyway. Sensei, what's wrong? Shino asked. Kuranai didn't respond immediately. She was occupied by the sight in front of her. It looked like a large mountain. But upon closer inspection it seemed to almost resemble a natural rock wall. A wall with a massive crack in it. She was right, it's them, she said. Neither Naruto nor Kiba got the chance to ask who, they, were. 
Before they could open their mouths, Akamaru began barking wildly. The question on Kiba's lips de instantly as he yelled for everyone to move. Nobody bothered asking why. Spears landed where the shinobi had been standing only a moment ago. The ninja scanned the area, finding several of the odd primitives that had Kei Hanata. They got their first good look at the people, who wore short pants, vests, and boots made of the skin of some local animals. Their exposed skin was painted in various tones of green and brown, making them blend in very well with their surroundings. Basic concealment technique. Kuranai thought, but very effective. Kuranai saw that they were outnumbered four to one and ordered a retreat. Naruto hesitated, brining his hands together to form the sign for the cage Bunshin no Jutsu, but Kuranai ordered him to stay down. She knew what they were dealing with now, and she wanted to make sure the genin knew as well before the proceeded. The four ninja made their escape smoothly. The group they saw seemed to simply be guards stationed at that crack. When they were far enough away she stopped the group. She saw Kiba and Naruto had shocked looks on their faces. Shino's face was as impassive as ever, though his aura radiated surprise as well. What's wrong? Kuranai asked. Sensei, we, Kiba stammered. It was, we saw, Naruto stuttered. We saw Hanata. Shino told her. What? She was with them. Naruto claimed. While retreating, Akamaru had suddenly stopped and sniffed the air. He was so still that Kiba barely grabbed him in time to save the dog from a spear aimed at him. It was who threw the spear that shocked Kiba. He stopped as well, causing Shino and Naruto to have to pull him along. Naruto almost stopped himself at the sight, but Shino pressed them forward. They had all seen it, but they couldn't believe it. The one who had thrown the spear was a girl, no older than them. Indistinguishable from the other primitives except for one feature. Pupil-less white eyes that, combined with the body paint, made her seem almost as if she was some living incarnation of the forest itself. A demon of the woods. There's no doubt anymore, then. Kuranai told her charges. Those primitives are the Nimari, the people of the forest. Despite her teammates' protests, Kuranai ordered a return to the village. She needed to fill them in before proceeding further. They didn't enjoy leaving Hanata behind, but they reluctantly agreed with the Jonan's logic that they couldn't rush in blindly or they'd never save Hienta. When they returned they went to the home of the doctor who had treated Shino and Kiba. The ninja and dog had some scratches Kuranai wanted to have tended to immediately, Kuranai began her explanation to her team immediately after the doctor gave them a clean bill of health. Those primitives were a tribe called the Nimari. Their name is a bastardization of Mori Nin. Forest ninja. Shino said. These guys are shinobi. Kiba asked. Not exactly. Kuranai answered. Long ago, well before the time of the country of Kanoa, there existed a hidden village known as Morigako no Sato, the village hidden in the forest. Their village was located in a thick wood in a deep valley. A valley surrounded on all sides by a rock wall that, to the outside observer, would look simply as a steep mountain. The broken rock wall. Shino said in realization. Kuranai nodded. Many years ago, shortly before the founding of Kanoa, the shinobi of Morigako was sea off from the rest of the world by a great cataclysm. It was described as a powerful shaking that caved in every single one of the tunnels and paths the Mori Nin used to get through the rock. The cause of that disaster is lost in legend. Some say it was simply an earthquake. Others say maybe they were trying to summon a demon and it went horribly awry. Regardless, their village was lost to the known world. The only ones who remained were those shinobi fortunate enough to be away from Morigakura at that time. Those survivors would eventually found the country of Kanoa and the village of Konohagakur. If they were sea off like that, how do you know who they are? Kiba asked. In the time of Hokage IV, an earthquake shook the land due east of here. A powerful shake that broke away much of the rock wall on that side of the Morigakur forest. The Morinin, held back so long, leapt at the chance to escape. However, time had not kind to the people hidden in the forest. Due to the lack of contact with the civilized world, the Mori Nin degenerated in order to survive. They were no longer the noble shinobi of the woods. They had become savages. Now calling themselves the Namori, they ravaged nearby towns, much like they are now. They also are people from the towns and brought them back to their home. Why would they kill people? Naruto asked. New B. The Nimari had been trapped in their valley for over a century. In all that time, they had nobody but each other. 
The inevitable inbreeding resulted in a dwindling of the people's numbers. They needed new bee for their tribe to grow. You mean, they took people, they took Hanata so they could, Kiba felt sick to his stomach. I'm not so sure. Kuranai said quickly, if that were true, they would have tried to K all of us. They were prepared to K us to keep Hanata only. Also, there have been no reports of a here. And no activity at all since Hanata's A. Shino reported. Kuranai nodded gravely. Um, excuse me, Naruto asked, his hand in the air, what about the last time? Were they stopped? Yes. Hokage Sama the fourth defeated the Nimari by once again trapping them behind their rock wall. He caved in the one path broken open before. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to save many of the people the Nimari had taken. Even if he could have taken them, they were lost. Kuranai's students exchanged looks of confusion. The Nimari still possessed some ancient jutsu, one of which was a powerful genjutsu that remade a person's mind. Whoever that person was in the past, they were transformed into a Nimari. That is what they've done to Hanata. Why would they do something like that? Naruto asked. What better way to make sure your prisoners won't run? Shino asked in reply. Not only that, but so long as they believed themselves Nimari, they would not only remain with the tribe, but resist any attempt at rescue. Exactly. Kuranai said, those few that were rescued needed a lot of time to become themselves again. Those who recovered most quickly were the ones who had been under the Nimari's thrall for a short period of time and had friends and family there with them. That's why you wanted people who know Hanata. Kiba stated. And why you hurried us here. Naruto pointed out. Yes, the four of us are currently the best chance of freeing Hanata before it's too. Kuranai was interrupted by the village doctor bursting into the room. Sensei-san. He cried out, come quick. Some of, of, them are outside. Them. Naruto asked. The raiders. The Nimari. Kuranai gasped. There's a girl leading them, she's demanding to speak to the shinobi here. A girl. Kuranai asked. She went to a window of the house which had a view of the path into the town. Fortunate in case someone was brining a W man or woman that way. But now, Kuranai wished to see this girl with the Nimari. She had a horrible feeling she knew who it was. Sure enough, there was band of Nimari, painted and clad in animal skins. And sure enough, at the head of that band, was Hyuga Hanata. Known to her people as Kash Huingar. She of the ghostly eyes. The Kanoa ninja looked at the group of Nimari assembled outside the village limits. The apparent leader was none other than Hyuga Hanata. She stood at the front of the group of just under 20 men and women of varying age. She was clad in the animal skin sleeveless vest, short pants, and boots that the Nimari favored. She was also adorned with small bits of jewelry, bracelets and a necklace that had small fangs on them. Beads strewed about her blue-black hair. Her exposed skin was painted in colors of the forest, providing camouflage in the woods. In the middle of her forehead was a black mark resembling a tree that Kuranai suspected wasn't simply paint. In her right hand was a wooden spear with a stone point. Kuranai didn't waste time. She went to a pad of paper on a desk and wrote something out. She handed the paper to the doctor and whispered something to him. When that was done, she motioned for the boys to come with her, stopping Naruto before he left. Naruto, create some cage bunch and send them around the perimeter of the village. Have them keep hidden until I tell you otherwise. Naruto nodded and did as Kuranai asked, creating a dozen shadow doubles of himself and sending them out. They used a window facing away from the Nimari so the primitives wouldn't see them. The real Naruto followed behind Kuranai and her team. They approached the group cautiously. Kuranai looked carefully to either side, spotting some of Naruto's bunch and hiding themselves nearby. The path the ninja tread was flat and had little or no vegetation other than a few bushes and some small hills. In spite of this, Naruto's clones were doing the job well enough that Kuranai didn't believe any of them had been seen. As they approached the Nimari, Akamaru leaped ahead and ran to Hanata, barking cheerfully. However, a glare from the girl brought the dog running back to his master. Hanata leveled her spear, pointing it at her teacher. You are the shinobi of the fire shadow. Kuranai was a little stunned. Hanata had just spoken with a heavy accent, as though she was speaking an until recently unknown language. Yet, she was speaking her native tongue. We are. I am Yuhi Kuranai. Kuranai said, introducing herself and trying to sound as if she'd never met Hanata before now. 
She thought it likely that acting familiar would only anger the girl. Especially if she'd been conditioned to answer to another name. I, Hanata began, am Kash Huingar, of the blessed line of the Nimari. Again, Kuranai was a bit stunned. Hanata was speaking with a confidence that Jonan had never heard from the girl before. She felt tension beside her and saw Shino looking at Hanata intently. He was clearly having thoughts along the same line. However, Naruto and Kiba. What's the matter with you? You're Hanata. Naruto yelled. Hugo Hanata. Kiba shouted. Kiba tried to move towards Hanata, but the other Nimari pointed their own weapons at the boy, forcing him to step back. You've interfered in our affairs several times now. Hanata said to Kuranai, ignoring Kiba and Naruto. Your people have interfered in the affairs of these lands. Kuranai counted. She was stalling. This was too good a chance to miss, but the timing had to be right. Some of Naruto's bunshin were slowing, they had trouble moving about the terrain without being seen. MM. Hanata arched an eyebrow at Kuranai. Kuranai cursed to herself. Could Hanata have noticed her glancing to the sides? With the Huga's skill for reading body language, it wasn't unlikely. Hanata handed her spear to one of her companions and brought her hands up to her chest. As she began weaving the signs necessary to activate the Byakugan Kuranai knew it was now or never. Naruto. Now. She yelled as loud as she could. The doubles Naruto created leapt out of their hiding places, surrounding the band of Nimari. The odds were considerably more in the Shinobu's favor now. The Naruto's pulled out and threw Shuriken at the Nimari, many were able to dodge but I hadn't been the intent. Instead, the primitives had scattered. Not much, but enough. They were no longer a cohesive unit they were now 18 separate people who happened to be on the same side. Hanata, whose forehead veins now pulsed out with the activation of her Keke Genkai began issuing orders. Once again surprising Kuranai by giving them in the Nimari tongue. Fluently and with confidence, by the sound of it, the scattered Nimari began to regroup, but Kuranai wasn't about to give them the necessary time. Her Genin students right behind her, she charged into the group. If their actions were any indication, Hanata's orders to the Nimari had been to split up and go one-on-one -on -one with their opponents. Each of them went after one of their enemies, except Hanata. She, along with two others, a boy and a girl slightly older than Hanata herself, focused on Kuranai, the biggest danger of the Kanoa Nin. If it were simply three Nimari, Kuranai wouldn't have had much trouble in capacitating them. At their best they seemed to be even with the Genin in one-on-one -on -one fights. The fact that most of the battles around her were about evenly matched confirmed this thought. However, Hanata's presence was a hindrance. Kuranai didn't want to harm her student, a sentiment her student didn't currently share. Also, Hanata was making good use of her two teammates. Often two of the three would attack in a feint, hoping to leave Kuranai open from a hit from the third member of the party. To make matters worse, more of the Nimari party began leaping into the fray. With a quick scan of the area she saw some of Naruto's cage bunch and had been defeated, those that had finished them were joining other fights. Two more were battling Kuranai, a third joined her partner in fighting with Kiba and Akamaru. Naruto and his other bunshin were having better luck with their foes. She saw one of the Nimari had even been defeated. Shino had one enemy surrounded by his chakra devouring insects. Before they could swarm the poor primitive, however, Hanata saw her comrade's trouble and acted. She shouted commands to her teammates. They again repeated the patter of attacking Kuranai simultaneously, leaving an opening for Hanata. They were barely glancing blows, but they were enough. Kuranai suddenly felt her body get warm. Her chakra had begun overflowing in her, beyond her control. She knew immediately why. Hanata had struck two tenkatsu points on her body to increase her body's chakra flow. She didn't ponder the reason why for long, however, as Shino's insects suddenly stopped short of crawling onto the Nimari that was Shino's opponent. They began leaving the young boy, Kuranai estimated he was 17, and began going to a new target. Kuranai herself. The insects fed off of chakra. The massive amount Kuranai was putting out now thanks to Hanata had attracted the insects so strongly they were moving against Shino's commands. Surrender. Or you d. Hanata said, cold as ice. Won't happen. Kuranai said defiantly. Shino put all of his concentration into getting his insects under control. Too much concentration, it seemed, as his opponent was able to get the drop on him. Surrender. Or he d. 
Hanata said, equally cold. Kuranai hesitated, hoping Shino might solve his problem himself. She could handle the insects if need be. Elsewhere, Kuranai saw the last of Naruto's bunch and fall and Naruto himself surrounded by four Nimari. Kiba and Akamaru were no better off. Their opponents had managed to separate the two, damaging their ability to work as a team. Akamaru soon fell. Surrender, or they d. Hanata said. Finally, seeing no other choice, Kuranai raised her hands. She didn't dare risk all her students' lives. Especially since one of them wasn't really her student to begin with. Hanata walked to Kuranai, warning her that if the Jonan attempted anything her comrades would be k. Hanata put her fingers together and undid the tenkutsu hits she had inflicted earlier. Shino's insects, no longer swayed by the enormous meal of Kuranai's chakra, responded to Shino's mental commands once again. Shino took Kuranai's lead, and didn't attempt to use the insects to attack, knowing it would only lead to most, if not all, of the shinobi being K. The shinobi were each bound hands tied behind their backs. Kuranai noted that their hands were bound very tightly together by the wrists. This made it difficult, if not impossible, to form jutsu seals. It was a somewhat standard method for dealing with captured ninja. But Kuranai couldn't help but wonder if this was standard nimari practice, or if Hanata had something to do with the method. This whole incident disturbed Kuranai far more than she liked thinking about. What kind of genjutsu can change someone so greatly that they speak their first language like a foreign tongue, yet let them keep battle skills they couldn't have gotten any place but their homeland? His lure among the Nimari was the Kij. The name was derived from the lure given to the leader of Morigako no Sato. It was given only to the most powerful and respected ninja of the land. Had the village not been sea off and remained in contact with modern society, the Kij might well have been known as Kudime Kikij, the Ninth Wood Shadow. However, after many years of life, much of the power held in youth had left the old man. He still maintained much respect among his people, but his body had become frail, his bones brittle. It became far more difficult to replenish his life's flame after using his abilities. Soon a successor would be needed. However, he had something he wished to see before he was called to the next life. The Kish had to ensure that Kash Yuingar fulfilled her purpose for the Nimari. Until then, he would gasp every breath he could. Until that glorious day. It wasn't long after Kashu's hunting party left that it came back with the four shinobi of fire in tow. The Kish looked outside of his hut, constructed high around the top of one of the forest's tallest trees, to see the captives as they were led to where they would be held. He saw the red-eyed woman and the three boys, led in by the young men and women who had served in the hunting party. The Kish noted some of their number were missing. He told himself to ask Kashu about it when she reported. Hopefully, it meant only I and no death. Their numbers were precious few, not even 200, and the coming days would need as much manpower as they could muster. The Kish sat on the mats scattered about the floor of his hut, waiting for the arrival he knew would come. Nearly an hour later, Kashu Ingar walked in, dropping to her knee in a show of respect. The beads in the girl's hair rattled against each other as she bowed her head. The paints that had covered her bare face, arms, and legs were now gone, revealing the pale skin underneath. She had gone to the village hot springs to cleanse herself after the hunt, as was Nimari custom. Only the seal on her forehead remained. She was barefoot, her boots sitting outside the hut's door. The Kish noticed something in the girl's arms, but wanted more pressing matters taken care of first. Honored Kish, she spoke, I am pleased to inform you that the shinobi of the fire shadow are ours. They are currently tied for all to see in the center. The center was the trunk of an ancient tree, long ago sea down, which rested in the center of the village that was often used for tribal meetings. He imagined the four had been tied to stakes in the center, in view of most of the village. There were I. Kashu continued, no deaths, however. The I have gone to the healers to seek treatment. Anything serious. S. One had trouble walking. However, the I refused our help, instead supporting themselves. They did not wish our goals compromised by removing the guard off the shinobi only for their aid. The Kish smiled at the pride that entered the girl's voice. She was no doubt pleased with the honor with which those under her command had acted. The Kish then heard an odd whining sound, and a whispered curse from the girl. He noticed then, that what the child had in her arms was a small pup. What is this, child? He asked her. This animal was carried by one of the shinobi. Kashu reported, 
I cannot explain why, but I was, compelled, to keep it away from that one. Oh, the Kij asked, interested. He noticed Kashu began to tremble a little. Those people, they kept calling me something. A name, the Kij said, not a question. A statement of fact. Kashu's face shot up, her pale white eyes looking into those of the older man. Hanata, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Did you have any other strange, compulsions, besides keeping the dog? Well, the girl started, beginning to sound nervous, I ordered that the edge of the plaza be coated in the ointments we used to keep insects away, but I know why I did that. She suddenly yelled, as if trying to convince herself, one of them can control insects. The repelling ointment will prevent them from coming to his aid, the Kish said approvingly, anything else. The third boy, my face becomes warm when I look at him. I only thank the goddess that my face was painted or I'd have looked foolish. Why does this happen to me with them? The answer, my child, is simple. They are from before. Before, you mean, she asked, disbelieving. Yes, before you came to us. Before you underwent the rites of purification and became Nimari. They came for me, the girl exclaimed, her cold as ice attitude faltering. They did. Why? Why else? They fear your powers in the wrong hands. Namely, any hands but their own. You are of the blessed line. The power of your ghostly eyes is proof. Those of the line were lost in the great closing that sealed the Nimari in this valley. Many were among those who were gone at that time. Those few who remained d in the disaster. Those who remain are servants of the flame. We had feared all hope was lost when we discovered this, so many years ago. But, the goddess has delivered you to us. The moment I saw you, I knew. You were chosen among the blessed, Kashu Ingar. Thank you, sir, Kashu said, once again feeling warmth in her face. Is there anything else to report? The Kij asked. There is not. All that is left is to decide the fate of the Shinobi. It is dangerous, to simply leave them. They could interfere with the rituals should they escape. Yet, at the same time, K them outright might not be advisable either. They are powerful, if they were able to resist yourself and several of our warriors. Shall you purify them, honored Kish, as you did me? I would like to, but I fear for my health should I attempt it. I no longer possess the great strength of my youth. My life's flame does not rekindle like yours can, my dear. Then what shall we do? Kash you asked. Despite the risk, we will leave them for now. They shall still be purified, but not until after. When you have finished your role in future events, you shall bring them to our number. Yes sir, Kash you said. Kash you Ingar couldn't help but feel another unexplained emotion. Though she did not understand why, she felt relief that the shinobi would not be K. When all is done, no taint will be so strong it cannot be destroyed before you. Yes, honored Kij. With the Kij's leave, she rose and left to retire for the night. Soon, the Kij thought as he watched her leave, the very world will return to the purity of nature. Just as we did. For soon, she of the ghostly eyes, you will become our goddess made flesh. The four Kanoa Shinobi found it difficult to sleep that night. Not surprising, as they were standing, tied to poles stuck in the top of a giant tree trunk. The four ninja were aligned in a circle with their backs to one another. To Kuranai's left was Kiba, to Kiba's left Naruto, to Naruto's left Shino, and to Shino's left Kuranai. Spread around them was a sticky, translucent substance which Shino reported made his insects very hesitant to leave his body. Since their arrival in this village, Kiba and Naruto spent most of the time switching between bickering with one another and complaining about the circumstances. Shino was characteristically quiet. Kuranai was silent as well, watching those around her throughout the day. Kuranai studied everything intently. The Nimari village consisted of circular wooden huts high around the trees. They were seemingly built to be one with the tree, with the roof and floor extending outward. Kuranai thought it looked almost as if the huts were growing out from the trees. A series of bridges and ladders were scattered in an arrangement Kuranai could only assume made sense to their captors. The Nimari villagers had spent the day taunting the four shinobi. Kids came by, occasionally pelting them with rotten fruit and vegetables. While Shino and Kuranai had taken a few, Kiba and Naruto had proven the most amusing of targets, as they often yelled and complained the loudest. Shino and Kuranai gave little reaction, making them less fun. Kuranai periodically tested their bonds. Nothing special. The knots weren't easy to undo, nor were they impossible. 
she and at least one of the genin should be able to do it. But Kurenai gave them instructions not to escape yet. She wanted time first. She wanted to learn more of their situation if at all possible. Luck seemed to be on their side when a yip-yapping noise was heard. It took a moment for the noise to register as a dog's barking. There were dogs in the village, so it could easily be one of them. However, for one in their party, this bark was recognizable. A Kamaru. Kiba yelled out, it's a Kamaru. He was stomping his feet in excitement. He had been worried about his partner from the moment Hanata took the dog away. Listening, Kurenai and Shino recognized the dog's familiar barking as well. Kiba, what does a Kamaru say? Hmm, Kiba listened, he says he's with Hanata. She went to see their leader. He doesn't know what they talked about. They spoke another language. Kiba listened further, now not bothering to translate as he went so as to get more of the message. Kiba listened until Akamaru's bark suddenly see off with a loud yelp. Akamaru, Akamaru, Kiba yelled, almost sounding like he was howling. What happened? Kurenai asked. I don't know. Akamaru just stopped. He screamed out, like something was attacking him. If Akamaru is with Hanata, Shino said, she might have realized Akamaru's barking was more than just a loud dog. How can that be? Naruto asked, I thought she didn't remember us at all. That doesn't seem to be entirely true. Kurenai said, she has the memories, but it seems they've been pushed away, to make room for the personality of this, Kashyu Ingar. Huh. Naruto asked, Hanata's memory hasn't been lost or erased, just put to the side. Think about her actions. She laid out this strange substance around us. As a result, Shino's insects can't leave his body, and none on the outside can come to us. She took Akamaru away from Kiba. And if she has Akamaru with her, it would explain why he was just silenced. Kurenai was silent a moment before speaking again. Naruto, while on the way here, did Hanata look at you? Ha, huh. come to think of it, I think she kept glancing at me. When I looked at her, though, she turned away. Does that mean anything? I mean, she does that all the time. Ugh. Kiba muttered, how can you be so dense? What? Kiba. Shino warned just as Kiba had begun speaking again. They both knew of Hanata's feelings for Naruto. However, they had agreed not to say anything to Naruto until Hanata did. It wasn't their place to reveal Hanata's secrets. Kiba, what did Akamaru say before he stopped? Well, Hanata talked to these guys' leader then went to a different hut. I guess her home. He said she sparred with some of the village boys and beat them all. Wow, go Hanata, Naruto said. The whole time, though, Hanata acted very different from what Akamaru knew. He said she was sleeping, but I think Akamaru woke her. Kurenai considered what she'd been told. Hanata's mind had been literally transformed and made her think she was someone else. But why? And how could they undo it? Kurenai didn't think it'd be possible to take Hanata by force and do it after returning home. She'd be heavily protected here, considering the amount of reverence these people seemed to hold her in. Wait, reverence. The blessed line of the Nimari, Kurenai said aloud, remembering the words of Hanata earlier in the day. Come again. Kiba asked. The reason for their taking Hanata. I think it has to do with being a Huga. They want her Keke Genkai for something. But what? Naruto asked. It was Shino who answered. Sensei, when you told us of these people, didn't you tell us of a rumor? That they had tried and failed to raise AD. Kurenai exclaimed, following her student's train of thought, that is a definite possibility. They want to try again, and somehow the Byakugan can help them. Unfortunately, we still have too little to know for sure. I think we should wait to make our escape. We still have time, and we might learn something else. Ha! Huh. Kiba and Naruto said together. Time for what? The dog ran and hid the moment the stone spearhead flew by its face. Kashyu Ingar sat it on her futon, made of furs and a bird down pillow. She had been sleeping badly, and waking up to the animal's noise didn't help. Especially since hearing it had brought about another of those strange impulses she'd had of late. For some reason, she knew the dog shouldn't be allowed to speak. As if someone could understand it. In a way, though, she was almost grateful to the pup for waking her. Her dreams bothered her. She kept seeing faces, hearing voices, smelling scents. All of it was incredibly familiar, yet she couldn't recall any of it. Some of it was pleasant. 
she saw the boys she now knew to be fire shinobi in her dreams, giving her encouragement and friendship. The woman as well. She saw the woman speaking with authority, explaining various points on various subjects. Kashyu also saw a man, with eyes as white as hers, berating and yelling at her. A small child, a girl with white eyes, looking up at her and smiling. The word, Nisan, was clearly heard by Kashyu at this point. They were before. Before she came to the Nimari. Before she became she of the ghostly eyes. The dreams upset her greatly. She always felt great pain in her heart. She didn't know if it was regret or something else. If she woke during the white-eyed man's part in the dreams, Kashyu would awake with tears flowing down her cheeks. With the blonde boy, her cheeks would be burning red. She wiped tears from her eyes. Tonight's dream had been the white-eyed man. Kashyu, a voice called. Yes, father. The man who entered the room was clearly not Kashyu's father. His name was D.A. Iriaga. He was Kashyu Ingar's guardian. At age 48, he had battled when the Nimari had fought the fire ninja before. He had also overseen the rearing of many outsiders who had been purified into Nimari. He was handpicked by the Kish to watch over Kashyu Ingar. More dreams, he asked. Kashyu nodded. Many who were purified had the dreams of their past four weeks, even months after. Though by the end of the first half of the first year the dreams always faded completely. The dog, Kashyu said, almost as an afterthought, it shouldn't be allowed to speak. We should muzzle it. As the dog whined, D.A. Iriaga kneeled down before his surrogate child. Do you know why? He asked. His master, they can communicate, I think. Tears from the dreams were flowing from her eyes again. D.A. Iriaga embraced the girl in his arms. All the confidence she had in daylight seemed to fade at these times. D.A. Iriaga thought she must not have had an easy life before. Perhaps this is not the best time, then. It's been decided, she asked. The signs say that the best time to perform the rituals will be three days from now. Three days, she repeated. The Kish will prepare everything. You will not be needed until the final moments. I am nervous, Kashyu said, growing more excited. What if I fail? The great disaster could befall us again. You needn't fear. D.A. Iriaga told her, the possibility of you failing is not something I, or anyone else, has considered. You are strong, and because of that strength we all have faith in you. You needn't fear, he repeated, you will succeed. Now rest. D.A. Iriaga gave his surrogate child a good night K on the forehead before getting to his feet. He looked around the room a moment, before finding the dog Akamaru and taking the animal with him out of the room. He would see to Kashyu's request to muzzle it. As Kashyu laid herself back down, her hand went to that same spot D.A. Iriaga had K. She ran her finger across the tree sign that marked her as an outsider purified into the Nimari. Gradually, she drifted into sleep once more. D.A. Iriaga's affirmation that she would not, no, could not fail, helped ease Kashyu's worries. Enough so that she could easily deal with her dreams that night. At daybreak, the Kanoa ninja saw Hanata again. Kurenai watched as her student, wearing Nima garb and surrounded by what could only be called an honor guard, walked to them. Kiba noticed immediately that Akamaru was in Hanata's arms. The pup was whimpering sadly behind leather muzzle tied around his mouth. Shino kept quiet, his eyes never leaving Hanata. Naruto, who was tied behind Kurenai with his back to everything, kept trying to see around the log he was tied to, asking what was going on every few seconds. Hanata, Kiba shouted, you better have one damn good reason for muzzling Akamaru. Hanata ignored Kiba, who began shouting various expletives, and turned to Kurenai. Our honored leader, the Kish, has decided your fate. I have been instructed to inform you of it. Fearing their sentence could easily be immediate e, Kurenai decided that it was time to make a move. She and the Genin boys had already planned their actions out to coincide for the inevitable moment when Hanata, for one reason or another, would come to confront them. She had to, she was probably the only one among the Nimari who spoke their language. Kurenai used her hand, tied behind the log and out of sight, to touch Kiba's hands gently. Kiba quieted for a moment while he ran his fingers through Kurenai's palm, acknowledging the signal to begin. Kurenai thought he heard Kiba mutter a quiet apology to Hanata. Hey, Hanata, I asked you, why is Akamaru muzzled? This time Hanata turned to the boy. He was noisy, so I had him quieted. Do I need to muzzle you as well? 
What did you say? You wouldn't be so tough if I weren't tied up. Hanata just smirked. I won't fall for such a simple trick. She told him, obviously believing he was trying to trick her into releasing him. You won't face me like a ninja. Like a Huga. Kuran I saw Hanata tense at the mention of the name Huga. She recovered by resuming her message from where she left off. In two days time, you are to be purify. Coward. Kiba yelled, weakling. You wouldn't dare face me in an even fight, would you? Quiet. Hanata snapped. Kuran I couldn't help but find it just a little creepy to hear Hanata speaking that way. I picked up little of the language sitting here all night. The girl of the ghostly eyes. That's what your fake name means, right? It is not fake. Oh, because I thought your name was Huga. Shut up. Hanata screamed suddenly. Just as suddenly, her balance became unsteady. She let go of Akamaru as she began clutching her head, as if struck by some invisible object. The Nimari honor guard, as well as bystanders, surrounded the girl to see to her. The dog ran towards Kiba. Now, Kuranai said, just loud enough so that the Genin would hear her. Kuranai brought forth her hands, loosened from their bonds by several hours of work during the night. She formed a sign in front of her, causing a smokescreen to suddenly blast out from nowhere. Shino loosed his bonds and quickly helped free Kiba and Naruto, who hadn't been so fortunate with their own ropes. In the seconds needed to free the two genin, the Nimari's surprise had faded. Some began weaving signs Kuranai knew would result in her smoke being cleared. She touched Naruto on the shoulder, who immediately placed his hands together. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Four Naruto's appeared in the smoke. Henge. Naruto cried, making three of the Naruto's transform into replicas of Kuranai, Shino, and Kiba. The Bunshin charged from the smoke and into battle. Meanwhile, the real shinobi made their escape in the opposite direction. The doubles were see down quickly by the nimari, disappearing in puffs of smoke. But the distraction gave the leaf shinobi time to retreat. They made their escape by leaping from the various tree branches to the village entrance they had been brought in from. Most nimari they crossed were surprised enough by their sudden appearance and disappearance that none thought to grab a weapon or raise an alarm until the ninja was safely distant from them. Kuranai Sensei. Naruto asked as they passed the outskirts of the hidden village, what exactly happened? Kiba. Kuranai said, indicating he should explain. I'll put it in tiny words for you. Kiba said with a grin, one Naruto didn't return, when me, Hanata, and Shino first got teamed up. You can figure I had a hard time. Yeah. Naruto said, now grinning, you're an even bigger loudmouth than me and you got stuck with two of the quietest people in the village. Exactly. Kiba said, letting the loudmouth remark slide, it drove me nuts. Shino wouldn't say a word, and Hanata was so shy she couldn't. I figured out right away Shino was a lost cause, so I started bugging Hanata all the time, trying to get her to open up a bit. To at least say something to me. How'd that go? Naruto asked as he jumped from a branch. He failed. Shino answered, if anything, he only scared Hanata. Finally, Kiba said, Resuming his place, I walked up to Hanata and told her flat out. I'll make you speak to me. Even if it means the only words you ever say are, shut up, Kiba. Kashu Ingar held her head as those words echoed in her mind. The moment she had told the dog's master to, shut up, those words, his words, had burst from her lost memory. Everything else was drowned out by the Kiba boy's words. D.A. Iriaga, a member of Kashu's honor guard, held his foster daughter tight. Her feet had become unsteady with the re-emergence of memories. He kept her from falling to the ground. After a few moments, the voice subsided and Kashu was able to look around. She saw the empty logs and broken bonds and immediately recognized what happened. They escaped, she said, stating the obvious, I'm sorry. Do not be. D.A. Iriaga told her. They escaped because of me. Because I'm not strong enough to put the past behind me. To do that is difficult for anybody. For you even more so, because the sources of your memories were here before you. Indeed, fearing such an occurrence, D.A. Iriaga had asked that someone else be the one to tell the shinobi of their purification. Unfortunately, nobody could do it. Even those who were themselves purified in the past had long forgotten their own language. Kashu was the only person who had any knowledge of it meaning she was the only one to tell them what was going to happen. Others will take up the hunt. D.A. Iriaga told her, 
For now, put what happened from your mind. Prepare yourself for the coming rituals. Strengthen yourself, body and soul, so that you may do the Nimari proud. I will, father, she responded, her voice lacking the confidence of Kashyu Ingar and sounding more like Hugo Hanata. In the dense wood outside of the Nimari village, Kur and I leapt from tree to tree. The Genin followed behind her, bewildered. Kur and I seemed to be searching for something. Naruto even asked Kiba if she was lost. Doubt it. Kiba answered, she's got a good enough sense of direction to know we aren't near the crack in the mountain we got in her from. That would be a dangerous place to go. Shino said, the Nimari will likely swarm there to see us off. Besides that, she's also been looking at the ground, she's searching for something. What? Naruto asked. Right below us. Kur and I said, surprising her students, I was looking for them. She pointed to the ground beneath them. There the Genin saw a group of people camped out. About four in all. Three men, one woman. They were all looking right at the ninja. The ninja saw the four individuals, all with milky white eyes and Hittai eight bearing the leaf sign on their foreheads, and immediately recognized who they were. Are they? Naruto asked. Hyuga. Kiba finished. Yes. There are backup. Kur and I answered. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.